And now it is uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor uh, Laubenberger. He is the fourth professor of bioengineering and head of the Department of Biological Engineering at MIT. He holds joint appointments in the Departments of Chemical Engineering and Biology as well as Centers for Biotechnology Process Engineering, Biomedical Engineering and Cancer Research. He received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from University of Illinois, a PhD in Chemical Engineering from University of uh, Minnesota. He joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania rising through the ranks and serving as professor and chairman of the Department of Chemical Engineering. He then moved uh, to the University of Illinois as professor in the Departments of Chemical Engineering and Cell and Structural Biology. He moved to MIT in 1995. He has received numerous academic honors and awards, including membership in the National Academy of Engineering and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has also held many distinguished lectureships and professorships. The title of his presentation is In Vivo Systems Analysis of Inflammatory Pathophysiology. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lauenbart. Thank you for the wonderfully kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? Back in the hinterlands? Yes, thank you for the thumbs up. Very good. Ah, it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited about uh, the rest of the day and also uh, catching up with. Uh, one of my postdocs has been here all week, uh, Kelly Chen, uh, to uh, hear about what she's been learning about uh, from, from everybody else this week. So I'm happy to uh, provide a contribution. I think what this program is doing and the whole associated uh, 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 modeling and immunology uh, is exceedingly important. So happy to be part of it. Okay, let me uh, begin by emphasizing what I'm going to show you today has been a, a terrific partnership uh, with colleague Kevin Haggis at uh, MGH uh, in uh, trying to bring some of our analysis uh, methods uh, in vivo, uh, which I think uh, everybody's interested in, of course. And let me also start so that uh, I, I don't forget this by emphasizing that along with Kevin, uh, a terrific postdoc, Ken Lau, jointly uh, initiated a lot of this work. You can see some of the early publications. Uh, he's now at Vanderbilt. And then more recently, Sarah Schreier and uh, Dr. Jesse Lyons uh, here. Uh, some of the work I'm going to show you has been published. Uh, the latter part has not, so there's uh, plenty of new things here. And certainly want to uh, acknowledge and gratefully uh, financial support. OK, so what's, what's our motivating uh, problem? Our motivating problem is, uh, for examples like this, your mucosal immunology, or others. They're just complex physiology, complex pathophysiology. And they all have many moving parts, many different cell types, uh, many different phenotypic behaviors, cell-cell communication, interactions and molecules, uh, networks inside each cell governing all the various phenotypes. And if anything is pathological at all, one would like to be able to intervene. You'd like to be able to intervene with a small molecule drug, or an antibody blocking some uh, chemokine or cytokine, or anticytokine or chemokine itself, or you might want to add or deplete particular immune cell types. All of these things are experimentally possible and clinically uh, attractive. The question is, what's going to happen when you do it? So these days, the issue isn't what can one do experimentally for therapeutic perturbation. It's, do you have any notion of what's going to happen when you do? So that's what we're after. Now, one of the nice things about these complex, many moving parts systems is that toward a therapeutic intervention, you have many different targets. There's so many things that contribute, so many cell types, so many pathways, so many uh, uh, chemokines and cytokines and growth factors and proteases and so forth, that there's no single magic bullet. Aha, this pathology depends on this gene, crucially, and only that gene, or this cell type, or that molecule. So it's actually an advantage because you see many different ways to intervene, many alternative uh, therapeutics. Uh, but one again has to be able to understand what's going to happen when you do. So that's that's conceptually what we're after. All right, the example problem today, uh, by and large, is in intestinal uh, pathology. Uh, this is all going to be in mice. 
Uh, we've started to take this into uh, some human uh, patient samples as well. I'm not going to show you any of that today. But with uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha as a central molecular actor in a variety of uh, stimuli, whether they're microbial or chemical uh, or even genetic, uh, what happens uh, downstream of TNF-alpha? What are, how are the players working together to lead to pathologies, uh, especially today when we talk about epithelial cell proliferation and death that then in fact can compromise barrier function and lead to different diseases. You all know this, the intestine is actually the largest lymphoid organ of the body. This TNF is an essential mediator. Uh, there's many uh, related pathologies, Crohn's, colitis, colon cancer. And uh, how they all work together uh, is, uh, is a really, really terrific challenge. So here's how we go about it. If that was the conceptual problem, here's our conceptual address. And that is coming from an engineering background. We're very comfortable with many different factors, uh, getting information about those factors and trying to pull it all together you know, in a way to get uh, predictive models, uh, even if you don't have complete information. So let me march you around this kind of circle of illustrations. For any given cell type we're interested in, and in this case today, we're mainly focused on intestinal epithelial cells and what's governing their death and proliferation. We could be just as interested in any of the immune system cell types uh, and so forth. But in an epithelial cell type here, uh, what's going to govern proliferation and apoptotic death are uh, numerous, uh, mainly kinase pathways. So if we're going to understand what what's governing the epithelial cell behavior in the mouse intestine, we're going to have to make measurements across multiple kinase pathways. If we don't do that, we won't have the crucial information that's actually governing what they're going to do. Now, you ask under what stimulation conditions of uh, cytokines and growth factors and so forth should we make these measurements? Which one best fits, best mimics physiology? Well, none of course, because physiology is a very wide-ranging uh, landscape. So the way we would go about it in vitro would be to use many different combinations of all the different things that we think these cells might see and drive this network into many different states, measure the phenotypes, and thereby get the information. Now, of course, in vivo, uh, it's not that you add all these things exogenously the way you want. They come from other cell types. Shane might re uh, recognize this, uh, this diagram because it's hers. Uh, and I like it. Uh, it's about how the different cell types are actually trading communication molecules, cytokines, growth factors between themselves, because that's where they come from. You don't add them exogenously. So now how do you get biological variation uh, instead of, in culture, adding these things that all sorts of different uh, permutations? Well, that's what different individuals before are for. If you use five different mice, even for the same condition, they're going to behave differently. Even if they're the same strain, they're still not going to be identical. And so you will get different intrinsic concentrations of these molecules and different cell types and so forth, as if you had added the variation yourself in vitro, the mice do it for you. And so as you'll see in our approach, everybody worries about individual variation, okay, whether it's human patients or animals. With the modeling considered in the right way, it's actually a plus. If you have two mice that behaved identically, you've wasted a mouse. Okay? So that's, that's uh, what you've got to think about. So we're going to bring these same kind of measurements now into mouse cells in vivo and also try to figure out what's going on outside the cells that still governs the networks going on inside. So it's multi-scale, I would call it, because we're inside cells, we're looking at what's outside cells, different cell types, and then in, in, then in vivo. Now, of course, you get data sets, as I'll show you. Uh, intuitively, you can't uh, really think about them very well. Thus, you have no choice but to think about uh, computational modeling methods. Uh, our lab is pretty agnostic about various different types. Today, you'll see mostly things that will just look like uh, algebra, because that's what they are. You'll see a little bit of logic modeling. Through the rest of the week, you've already seen uh, uh, some of the other types. So, so maybe this will be complementary. And the kind of use depends on the questions you're asking in the data. Now, one thing that's, I think, important, uh, again, conceptually to think about is whether you're looking at your model in a theory-driven way or a data-driven way. I come from a chemical engineering background. 
this is what I learned to do, is that you knew enough about your system, you wrote down hypotheses, you wrote them down mathematically, and you said, if I simulate these differential equations, can I get behavior in experiments so that I can predict? Now, what I've learned in, in, in cell biology over the last uh, 30 years is that in most cell biological systems, with some exceptions, we know so little about this that this is really, uh, well, really, really daunting. And so, where you gain more purchase is by making measurements across things and not knowing exactly what's important and why it's important and uh, how it's important in relationship to others, and then letting these data-driven computational models generate the hypotheses and generate the predictions. And when you can move over to theory-driven models, all the better. One reason I like logic modeling, you'll see a little bit at the, at the end, and I think agent-based modeling falls into this category too. You actually can apply it in either mode. You can really a priori pose uh, agent-based models and logic models, or you can learn them. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's an advantage of both those types. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is what we've done over the last decade or so for cells and culture, just to show you the types of data that might be generated and the ways that it's going to be looked at with the computational analysis so that when I launch into the in vivo data, then you'll understand what these plots mean and, and what we're trying to convey. So remember that what we're after is some type of phenotypic behavior, uh, proliferation or death, let's say, of intestinal epithelial cells. We're going to do it in mice. Uh, where they're going to see lots of different things for the past decade or so, uh, largely driven by a, a, a terrific PhD student, Kevin James, who's now at uh, University of Virginia, intestinal uh, epithelial cells in culture, and then adding these different types of factors and then seeing what happens phenotypically, proliferation uh, or, uh, or, or death. Now, the way most cell biology has been, been undertaken for these decades is you pick some signal like June kinase, some intracellular signal that you think for genetic reasons or literature reasons is really crucial and that that should be governing uh, what's going on to a large extent. Well, what we can show is that if you measure that, any signal, pretty much name it, under a variety of different conditions, the relationship between the phenotype, apoptosis being high or low or, or intermediate, its relationship to any one of those signals is going to be quite complex. It's not going to be simply monotonic and, and uh, univariate. So what we do is flip the problem inside out and say for any given one of our treatment conditions, we will plot the outcome, high or low or intermediate apoptosis, for instance, in a multidimensional space of the molecular regulatory measurements that we've made. And now this will look complex, but we'll use uh, multivariate uh, regression methods like principal components analysis, uh, partially scores regression, to sort out on latent vectors or eigenvectors the weighted combinations of these molecular measurements that are in fact associated with high apoptosis or low apoptosis or intermediate. And these can become hypothesis generators, these actually can become predictive models, you can look inside them and see what they mean. Uh, so in the end if they work well, what you can do is have either measurements or predictions of the intracellular signals, put them into the eigenvectors, predict under any given perturbation whether you should get higher or lower apoptosis or proliferation, and match it up against the experimental uh, measurement. And if you get a robust model, you should be able to move up and down this line regardless of what molecular manipulation you make. Okay. Now, the way this is looked at and you get insight out of it is from two kinds of plots. Uh, one that's called the scores plot, and that's the information content of any given Q condition. So under any given condition, a Q insulin treatment or TNF treatment for these epithelial cells, you measure the signals, you project those measurements on the eigenvectors, latent variable one or latent variable two, and that will tell you the information that the cell is reading. So under pure TNF treatment conditions, all these kind of signals will project onto a latent variable that's strongly associated with death. Under insulin or EGF treatments, all the signals that are generated will project on largely to another axis that's mainly survival and proliferation. So any given treatment condition or perturbation will tell you whether you're giving information content to the cell network that's pushing you one phenotype or another. The other type of plot is called a loadings plot. And now 
we look at any given signal across all the different treatment conditions, all the different cues, and now project them also on the same eigenvectors. And in this particular case, across all the different TNF, insulin, EGF, etc., treatment conditions, we plot the activity of the kinase IKK upstream of NF kappa B, projected on the eigenvectors, and we find some very interesting things. That at short times, those signals push the cells towards survival, and at longer times, they push the cells toward death. They're actually doing two different things mechanistically. These are controlling caspase regulatory molecules. These are controlling cytokines and chemokines that feed back. Okay, so you actually get biological insights along with a pure numerical predictive power. And that's, that's pretty powerful to get both at once. All right, and, and we've done this, uh, as I said, for more than a decade on a variety of things, looking at dextrocellular matrix and growth factor effects, including in stem cell uh, differentiation, effects of small molecule kinase inhibitors in cancer, effects of different genetic mutations and genomic backgrounds, and have been able to understand the roles of uh, multiple pathways working together. And all along the way, what everybody said, well, well that's very cute. You can now understand cell biology and signaling networks and governing proliferation and migration and differentiation, but it's all in cell culture. What about in vivo? Okay, so uh, Kevin Haggis was a, a postdoc with Tyler Jacks, who's really one of the supreme cancer mouse modelers uh, that's been around for the last couple decades. And I met Kevin while he was a postdoc, and he said, we can take this into mice. Okay, the, the concept ought to work. The question is, can you make the measurements? Uh, and uh, so we will see. So the very simplest, what I'm going to show you first, is the very simplest experiment we did to see whether this was, in fact, even feasible technically. So we took mice, uh, black six mice, that will become important later, and either treated them with a high dose of TNF systemically, or uh, a lower dose of TNF, or control, and right now I'm going to just talk about wild type. Later you'll see RAG1 knockouts, you'll see RAS mutants. And then, so you inject the TNF and it's going to go to the intestine along with other places and it's going to cause some uh, havoc there. And at periods of time afterwards, we're going to take the tissue out. We're actually going to sample it from the variety of different locations, because location matters. You get a different microenvironment, you're going to get different local factors affecting the epithelial cells. Take the tissues out and measure things like uh, cell proliferation, apoptosis, uh, signaling data, gene expression data, cytokine, chemokine data, different cell types that are there, and then develop the kind of models I just showed you. Now go into perturbation, small molecule kinase inhibitors, antibodies, cytokines, chemokines, and see if we can predict what happens next. Okay. Later, I'm going to show you some more complicated models, adoptive T-cell transfer models, and uh, so forth, if I have time. So here's the kind of data that one can generate. So under these different treatments, uh, if you pull out the duodenum or the ileum, and you measure proliferation by uh, uh, phosphohistone H3, what you can see is in the ileum, the TNF actually stimulates proliferation, both at low dose and high dose. In the duodenum, it actually suppresses proliferation. So the TNF, in combination with whatever else is there in the microenvironment, has two different phenotypic behaviors. If you look at apoptosis, it's exactly the opposite. By cleave caspase 3, in the duodenum with low dose, you get a late four-hour apoptotic peak. At the high dose of TNF, it comes uh, earlier. In the ileum, there's no effect of apoptosis at all, mm -hmm. not apoptosis at all. Uh, this is tissue lysates. You say, how do you know what's going on actually is in the epithelial cells? So we can do in vivo in situ immunohistochemistry and show whether it's the pH3 or the cleave caspase 3. We can show that it's actually taking place in the epithelial cells. So the biochemistry we do in the tissue lysates matches the biochemistry that we see in IHC. And we always do that to just make sure we can go back and the thing is happening in the real cells. And you'll see that again later too. All right, well, that's the phenotype. That's like putting the cells in a dish and adding growth factors and seeing uh, proliferation apoptosis. Can we do the phosphokinase signals? Yeah, we can. We can look across the dozen and dozen and a half kinase pathways and by Luminex measure activities uh, by phosphorylation of uh, MET, ERK, AKT, June, uh, IKK, uh, STAT3. And again, the different colors are in the ileum or in the duodenum, low dose or high dose TNF, and you get all the networks, uh, all the pathways changing. 
Basically, every pathway changes. Everything's being affected. All right, where did those effects come from? Well, it had to come from the combination of the TNF plus everything else they were seeing. So let's measure what else they're seeing. We had a panel actually of 50 cytokines and chemokines we could measure by Luminex as well. What's shown here is I think there's 23 of them as a function of time after adding low dose or high dose TNF in blue and the duodenum in red in the ileum. And again, you see a lot of them change. <coughs> Mildly, you might also look at this and say, well, I don't see any really important effects. Nonetheless, this is what's mediating the, the uh, response to TNF. So somewhere in here is the information outside the cells that's being reflected in the uh, networks inside the cells. Now, why do you see different cytokines and chemokines? Well, because you've got different cell, immune cell types there, along with your intestinal epithelial cells. So let's measure them by flow cytometry, measuring neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, uh, NK cells, uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, B cells, CD8, CD4s, Tregs, other different conditions. So you see we're putting together a multi-scale data set, cell types, extracellular cytokines and chemokines, and in the cells we're carrying about the phenotype, kinase pathways. And that's the data that the model is going to try to integrate and gain insights from and gain predictions from. You with me so far? Okay. Now, here's how we understand the data. And this is why I showed you those scores plots and loadings plots from the partial least squares regression in vitro, because I explained to you that this is going to give us insights uh, along with the predictions. So, we do partial least squares regression models, the matching the eigenvectors, the quantitative combinations of key, in this case, so the kinase signals, uh, discriminating against the different outcomes of no apoptosis in the ileum, or late apoptosis in the duodenum with low TNF, or early apoptosis in the duodenum with high TNF. And if you look at the scores plots, where the different mice for the different treatments and the different tissues plot, Here's one eigenvector, latent variable one, and clearly it distinguishes between, actually this is the proliferative outcome in fact, versus apoptosis. And then on the second eigenvector, it, di it discriminates between the late apoptosis and the early apoptosis. Okay, so the combination of kinase network signals uh, do in fact fall into eigenvectors that will discriminate these three phenotypic outcomes. Now you go to the loadings plots, you say, let me look at the different pathway activities that I've measured. MAC, ERK, uh, and RISC, MAC, ERK, P38, uh, C, June, June kinase. And transient activation of MAC, ERK, and P38 is strongly associated with suppression of apoptosis. And if you just look down under those conditions, this is the data on, on ERK. And you see that there is this transient up and down associated with this. Uh, the later activity, you see, is associated, in fact, with the apoptosis, okay, as, as put up here. And then earlier signals, uh, these transients through C. June, for instance, and ATF, are associated with apoptosis but delayed. So you can go back and inspect the actual raw data and see the features that are, in fact, associated with these. And you may have figured this out by inspection early on and say, oh, well, I see this, this must be associated with proliferation. All right, but these eigenvectors allow you to, to see them very explicitly. Now, what can you do with this? Okay, so number one, we can understand how these pathways work together to uh, give you apoptosis or proliferation in the different uh, tissue regions, but we're after predictions. So, what you might want to do is have an inhibitor against a kinase pathway that might be uh, effective in suppressing your hyperproliferation, we say, uh, or, or your apoptosis. So here's a very common one. Uh, a small molecule inhibitor for MEC. MEC is right upstream of ERK, uh, typically considered to be a pro-survival, pro-proliferative pathway. What if we have an inhibitor against MEC? So you go in, you do the same experiments, you got mice, same treatments, now you have a small molecule MEC inhibitor there. How can you understand what happens? Well, Right, now what we do is we make the measurements of the kinase signals, now under the MET conditions, and with the same model that we had before, the same set of eigenvectors, no new training, you just simply put those signals in the eigenvectors, 
And what it predicts is that now, even at low dose TNF, where before you had late apoptosis, you now would be associated with as if you had high dose TNF and early apoptosis. And the signals are projected to move up there. And so the mouse is seeing low dose TNF with a MEK inhibitor. Its network says, I'm seeing high dose TNF. So how do you test the prediction? Well, now you measure the apoptosis, and in fact, that happens. If you add the MEK inhibitor along with low-dose TNF, you shift the apoptosis to the earlier time, just like the model predicted. Okay, so it allows you to predict the effects of small molecule inhibitors. That's pretty good. Now, here's something I've really got to emphasize. If there's, if there's one slide you take home, one concept, this is actually it. That only knowing the effect on met, the MET pathway would have given you the wrong prediction. And this is the way clinicians are thinking right now, and biologists are thinking. I've got a ERK pathway matters, I've got a MEK inhibitor, I'm going to inhibit it, that changes that pathway. Okay. In order to get the correct prediction, you actually have to include the effects on all the other pathways, AKT and, and June kinase and so forth. Okay? Because if we only put into the model, because you can do this, if we only put into the model the suppression of the MEK and ERK pathway and assume that the other pathways stayed the same, here's what the model would have predicted. It actually would have predicted that we would get less apoptosis. It actually shifts it in a more pro-survival way. You only get the correct prediction if you actually also include the effects on the other pathways. So, now some people will say, well, of course, we know kinase inhibitors are dirty and they have cross uh, 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 off-target effects. That's not what this is. This is a clinical trial MEK inhibitor, very clean, very clean. So when you see effects of AKT and June kinase, it's not the molecule, it's the real biological crosstalk. The fact that these are not parallel pathways in isolation, but if I affect the ERK pathway, there's docking molecules and so forth that affect what happens in the June kinase pathway and the AKT pathway. Very clean drug, just complex biology. Okay, so you've got to get that straight. It's not the chemistry, it's the biology. It's real. This is not artifact. So in fact, what's true, and we figured out why this is the case, under, in this context, in the mouse intestinal epithelium, and this is not unique, the metric pathway is actually pro-death. When you activate it, it's actually pro-death. Why is that? It has to do with interferon gamma and the expression of another downstream docking protein that shifts some of the earth substrates and so forth. But as I said, you show that here, if all you did was affect MEK and ERK, you actually shift the model prediction to even later apoptosis. Okay, so you gotta know multiple pathways. It's not dirty chemistry, it's just complex biology. Okay, but this kind of model can handle it, because it says in your eigenvectors, I gotta add everything up, that everything changed. I just gotta know that everything else changed. I just can't pretend that I had a blocker against this signal, and I set that to zero, and now I just propagate everything else that happens. And I do that. All right, let me go to a more complex situation. And again, people in this room, uh, you know, understand uh, this biology. So you knock out uh, RAG1 in this case, and you essentially lose your lymphocytes. And this is just a biological experiment to help us understand what's going on. Okay, it's a perturbation. So, so now what does happen? What happens if you've uh, really wiped out your uh, lymphocytes? Interestingly, now we're only going to look at the duodenum uh, and the uh, apoptosis uh, just for, uh, for focus here. And we're going to compare just low dose, this is the lower dose TNF in the wild type to in the RAG1 null. So one, on the one hand, you get the earlier shift. So this is the wild type mice, low dose TNF, and RAG1 null. You get an earlier shift if you normalize the amount of uh, cleave caspase 3 to maximum. But if you now actually look at the amplitude, it's aggravated by at least a factor of 10. So you wipe out the lymphocytes, and these mouse intestines just melt in response to TNF. There's something protective that comes from the lymphocytes that's protecting them against the TNF. So we're going to tease that out. That's going to help us understand our system. Okay. You see that, so just low-dose TNF, take away the lymphocytes, and, and the mouse intestines explode. So what's going on? What's happened in the RAG1 knockouts? Do we have any theoretical ideas? No, we've got to make a lot of measurements. So we go into the intestinal epithelial cells again and now measure all those kinases, 
Uh, again, now here, the red dots represent the RAG1 nulls at low dose. So this is all duodenum. The two different blues are low dose and high dose TNF of the wild type. The red is the low dose TNF of the RAG1, not doubts. And you can see the red affects a lot of the kinase signals. Okay, remember they're modulated by what's in the environment. So here's now the cytokines and chemokines, and again, the blue is low-dose, high-dose with wild-type mice, the red is low-dose TNF with RAG1 knockouts, and you can see some of the cytokines and chemokines are changed. Not surprisingly, the absence of lymphocytes is changing something what's going on in the population. Before I tell you about what's going on in the population, let's go back to see if we can understand the effects actually back on the epithelial cells for their signaling network. So the same measurements of a dozen or so kinase pathways, but now in addition to the wild type low dose and high dose TNF, we also have the RAG1 knockouts. And again, we're putting together all the different tissue types to construct the model. And what happens is there's a whole new phenotype that emerges in the partial least squares regression model. Along with the two eigenvectors we had before, we now have a third eigenvector that really has to do with this very explosive apoptosis. That's order of magnitude is, is uh, really tremendously higher. So there's this third eigenvector that matters. Now, how do these kinase activities add up in these eigenvectors? Well, what one does is you can look at the weighting coefficients, essentially, the projections, the loadings on any given eigenvector. And if the one we're really interested in is this explosive apoptosis that's shown up by compromising the immune system. What you see is that the weighting coefficients, the loadings, are really high for four pathways. RISC, MEC, IKK, which is NF-kappa B, and AKT. And so what the model predicts is that if I know only those four pathways, I can tell you under every condition what's going to happen to the epithelial cells. Two of them are pro-death, IKK to NF-kappa B and MEC. Now, I've now shown you why MEC is pro-death in this case. And two are pro-survival, AKT and RISC. So the cell is balancing two pro-survival pathways against two pro-proliferation -prolifer survival uh, death pathways. And so under any given condition, you're going to get different activities of these four pathways. The cell is going to multiply by its weighting coefficients, and that's going to decide what it does. All right, we'll come back to that. Now, what about what's outside the cell? What matters of the cytokines and chemokines? If there's 50 we've measured and 23 that vary that with some significance, Let's look at them in the same way. So now here's a heat map, not of the kinase signals, but of the 23 different cytokines and chemokines that show variation across the different conditions. Tissue types, low dose, high dose TNF, RAG1 knockouts. Same type of plot, and now we can discriminate between, now over here is this early high apoptosis in the RAG1 knockouts. This is the severe uh, phenotype. And then we have late low apoptosis and early low apoptosis. All right, now let's look at the loadings. In this case, the loadings are not the kinase signals, but they are the cytokines and chemokines. Interestingly, almost by its lonesome, is the early amount of MCP1, or CCL2, seems to be associated with the most protective phenotype possible, the latest and the lowest apoptosis. So this model predicts that MCP1 is protective against TNF-induced epithelial cell apoptosis out of all these variations that we could have looked at. And I will point out where it is, is right here. And what this says is this little bit of difference between the red and blue here is the single most important contributor to protection against apoptosis. Okay? It doesn't look quantitatively any larger than a lot of the others, but the model is able to distinguish that. Okay. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. So what you can do is come in with uh, we can do it either way, either add CCL2 or come in with an antibody against CCL2. This is something you might do in a uh, anti-inflammatory uh, type of uh, a disease. Now measure the cytokines and chemokines, and they shift you up to the early and high apoptosis. So if you deplete the MCP1 CCL2, the cytokine mix that results tells you that you should have this horrible early high apoptosis. That's exactly what happens if you measure it. This is low-dose TNF, wild-type mice. Uh, this is now a wild-type mice, and all you've done is deplete CCL2, and now it operates as if it had been RAG1 knockout. Okay, exactly as the cytokine milieu eigenvectors predicted. Okay. 
All right, now what about the cell types? Now we go to the cell types and say, what's responsible for this uh, cytokine chemokine uh, milieu shift? So now you look at the different cell types under the different conditions, wild type, reg 1 null, and since we now know this is important, uh, uh, depleting the CCL2 MCP1, and you see three that have the shifts in the right direction, uh, uh, CD11B uh, minus macrophages, NK cells, and plasmacytine dendritic cells. So these are all potentially contributors. Now, of course, you can go in with antibodies or other types of chemical approaches and knock out each one of these cell types and show that, in fact, it is the plasmacytoid dendritic cells that's most responsible. Because uh, if I get rid of them, then I suppress that early and high apoptosis much more than NK cells or the macrophages. So you can start to trace through to the thread of the different cell types that are responsible. Okay, now you say, uh, and what might these plasmacytoid cells be doing? Well, now let's go back into the cytokine eigenvector model, partial least squares discriminant model, high and low apoptosis, early and late. Uh, now we have more signals showing up here when we add in the uh, uh, depleted MCP1 data. But over here, what we see projected most strongly with the highest apoptosis is interferon gamma. So there's something about interferon gamma being produced, which may not be a surprise. That then is associated with, a, with the high apoptosis. So we see that here. If we have wild type and just add interferon gamma, we get much more apoptosis of the intestinal epithelial cells. If we have the rag one no mice and have an antibody against interferon gamma, we can shift it down. So the model allows us to make these predictions about what happens if we perturb intracellular signals or extracellular chemokines. Now, where does the MCP1 come from? You can go back histologically and see which cell types are making it and which ones are TNF-induced and RAG1 associated. Turns out it's coming from the goblet cells, not the enterocytes, but the secretory cells. They're actually making the MCP1, which is a surprise to a lot of people, but it's true. So, long story all put together, what we've identified just from these multi-scale measurements and nothing more than eigenvector modeling is a whole thread of what happens in the intestine in response to TNF. So one thread of it is, under ordinary conditions, the T cells that we were able to show as T cells and not B cells are producing some signal that goes to the goblet cells, tells them to make MCP1. The MCP1 keeps out the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, and so the epithelial cells are really just responding to TNF and associated other things. When we've knocked out the lymphocytes, they're no longer sending the signal to the goblet cells that induces the MCP1. You don't induce MCP1, you now have more plasma dendritic cells. They're making interferon gamma, or causing it to be made. And the interferon gamma now, in synergy with the TNF-alpha, alpha, is shifting the balance of those four kinase pathways. See, so you can put together whole threads of cell types, chemokines, uh, intracellular signal pathways. And I want to emphasize, this is not the only thread of what's going on. This is the thread we found with this early analysis. We can now go back and trace other citing kinds of chemokines and the cell types responsible for them and put together a quantitative model with all these different types. We could go into the plasmacytoid dendritic cells if we wanted and try to measure their key signaling pathways that are responsible for what they're making. Voila, that's how you end up with nice agent-based models with, with the cell, cell level rules. Okay, so Here's the crucial part. I go back to the kinase pathways. The kinase pathways, that four pathway eigenvector model, accounts for all these things. You change the lymphocytes, you change the plasmoid cytoid dendritic cells, you change interferon gamma, you change MCP1. All of it ends up in those four kinase pathways, and the cell adds them up, and that tells what you're doing. You can show that here. So, what I've got on the y axis is just the projection, you just measure those four kinase activities under all these different conditions, multiply that by them by their loadings, their weighting coefficients, and if they project down here, you've got normal physiology on the negative end. If they project up here on the positive end, you've got the aggravated apoptosis. So wild type, low dose TNF, you're down here. Just take those wild type and deplete it of MCP1. Those four kinase signals multiplied by the weighting coefficients shift up here. If you had the rank one knockouts, those four kinase pathways multiplied by their weighting coefficients are up here. Now you just take out the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, you shift back to prevention. You take the wild type cells down here, just add interferon gamma, in synergy with everything else, you shift it up there. 
Okay, so the intercellular network of the cells of phenotype that you're interested in is just processing all this information. So whatever you're doing in your microenvironment, it all ends up in your phenotype of choice. So we're trying to now look at this with tumor cells and microenvironment. We're looking at this in other types of things. How do you interpret all these things going on outside and what will happen in your cell of choice? Uh, this is the language of translation. It's the signaling network that's just accumulating all this information for whatever you would do extracellularly. Okay, now, uh, a couple things. Let me take this a little bit farther. So this was all in black six mice. What if you have mice of different uh, genomic strains, genomic backgrounds? Are they all going to behave the same? Of course not. So they've got different genetic properties. So now if you take mice with different strains, uh, this is interesting, uh, the AKR, uh, just a low-dose TNF, uh, immense apoptosis. Much higher effect than even RAG1 knockout black 6. Okay? Uh, and, and so you might go back and you say, okay, well, is this because they have low MCP1 or high interferon gamma? No, that's not the case. Okay? There's other molecules involved. And in fact, we're on the trail of that, because now if you looked over here along with interferon gamma, you said, well, what else is there? Well, there's interleukin 12. And the 12 is also a strong projector for the high apoptosis. Turns out in this mouse strain, it's got really a, a unique haplotype that has uh, multiple mutations in the IL-12 locus that make it more active. And in fact, that now may be what you trace down. So what we're going to do is go back now with the AKR mice and do the same battery experiments and see how IL-12 comes out in terms of its strength and contribution. So you can start to match genetics with actual molecular mechanisms. Now, the next thing you might ask is, okay, but you know, if you say all the information ends up in the kinase pathways, but yet, so far, to make this modeling approach work, you've got to measure them. It would be nice not to have to make measurements of them. Can't you predict them from what's outside? So you have the different cell types, you have the different cytokines and chemokines and growth factors, measure all that, can I just now predict what's going on inside of the kinase pathways? Okay, that's a good thing to try to do. So now we're trying to do that. So we go now into the intracellular kinase pathway uh, uh, network downstream of a lot of these inputs. And again, we don't believe we have enough information to do full-blown uh, differential equation models, but we've come up with uh, what we call constrained fuzzy logic. That's uh, transfer functions that works pretty well. So the problem we've looked at is, okay, now what if you just have uh, your black six mice, but now you have different RAS mutations? And this is going to matter because, remember, the mac erc pathway was so important, and RAS is right upstream of mac erc and you get different phenotypic behavior in the mice, depending on if you've knocked out NRAS or have constitutively active KRAS or NRAS. What's happening up at this locus that then shifts the balance of the, those four pathways? Can we look at that? All right, so now we've done that. Now here's those uh, kinase pathways again, a heat map of their activities. Now for the control, NRAS uh, null, KRAS constitutively active, NRAS constitutively active, and you see a lot of changes. So it's not just the RAS map or pathway change. Lots of things change. You go back in, you do the same kind of partially squares model. The same four pathways are what's crucial, risk, MEC, IKK, AKT, uh, and you can segregate the different types of uh, uh, genetic mutations. So that's very interesting, that that same set of eigenvectors, those same weighting coefficients, actually account for the differences you get in phenotypic behavior when you have KRAS and NRAS mutations. Okay? The cell doesn't know it has a mutation. All it knows is that its kinase uh, pathway balance has changed, and it's going to behave accordingly. Now, can we actually turn this into some kind of an intracellular signaling model that will tell us then why things are different if I have different uh, RAS mutations? So as I said, instead of full-blown ordinary differential equations, we essentially have uh, graded transfer functions for every upstream, downstream uh, a node. Uh, can have AND and OR gates, but again, in a graded way. So what we do is we take our experimental data, signaling data, map it against interactome pathway databases, and then come up with, this is now in fact a logic model, I don't show you here, but each one of these nodes is a quantitative transfer function that's going to look like this or like that, uh, that says how if I have a certain activity upstream, what's my activity downstream? 
And in fact, we've been able to decipher what's happening between NRAS and KRAS mutations that shift the activities downstream more toward AKT uh, or IKK or through uh, MEK and ERK and so forth. So we're able to account for the differences with the uh, 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 RAS uh, mutations. So the point of this, number one, we've understood something. Number two, you can start to see how maybe we can get to the point that we don't have to actually measure the intracellular kinases. We actually can, in fact, develop models for them. And just from measurements of the extracellular milieu of cell types and cytokines and chemokines, we might be able to model our way then to the phenotype instead of having to measure it. And I'm certain we can. OK, I think I've got uh, a few minutes left. Let me go to the more complex uh, physiological model. So just adding a acute TNF. Uh, here what we've done is now we take our RAG1 knockout mice and now we adoptively uh, transfer back in naive T cells, either CD45s or CD25s, T RAGs as a control. And now of course what's happening, here's your mucosal uh, immunity. They're now reacting against the microbiome that's there in a naive way and that will set off the inflammatory cascade. So what's measured here in the colon now is instead of just uh, a cellular phenotype of proliferation or apoptosis in the epithelial cell, right now we've started with something that you would see more clinically, well, what's actually the thickness of the epithelial wall? Okay. So what's actually measured then out of each mouse is the thickness of the epithelial wall actually as a function of position in the colon. And so if you add Tregs, uh, you really get no thickening. If you add the CD45s, in some mice, you get a very severe inflammation and thickening in part of the colon and almost nothing in the other. In some of the mice, you get a more mild inflammation and thickening in some aspect in the other. So this is now our phenotype. And again, here's individual variation. Uh, here's a number of different mice and the, uh, the variation within them. Here's another whole set of mice and they're almost categorically different. Interestingly, it's not as if this is all just one big smear. That's an interesting thing in terms of thinking about physiological states. And then this. So, now we do the same thing. We measure the intracellular kinase signals in the epithelial cells, we measure the cytokines and chemokines, we measure the immune and inflammatory cell types that are there. The same battery of experiments that I showed you with the TNF-alpha. And now we just do it here, and now our phenotype is this thickness of the, uh, of the, of the colon wall. Same type of model, uh, uh, discriminatory partial least squares. Or in this case, I think this is just uh, principal components analysis uh, unsupervised. Uh, two of the eigenvectors, principal components. This one separates the severe inflammation from the mild inflammation from the Treg, no inflammation. Okay. Now let's look at the loadings plots, and I'm just projecting some of them. Uh, principal component one. Here's some of the key uh, cytokines and chemokines. Uh, as they were before and now. Some of them are, some of them are quite different uh, than we had before. It's a different biology. This is not just adding TNF. This is uh, what happens when your now naive T cells are responding to your microbiome. But these are some of the most important uh, cytokines and chemokines in projecting toward the severe inflammation. Uh, if you look at the intracellular signaling pathways, interestingly, one that's very highly uh, implicated is the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway uh, down to uh, S6. Uh, and again, we can go back in vivo and see that that's the case. And very important, we can show that it's in the intestinal epithelial cells. A lot of people have looked at mTOR in the immune system cells. That's not the issue here. It's actually the activation in the epithelial cells themselves that we can demonstrate by IHC. Uh, we can show that uh, then the mTOR signaling is induced in the epithelium and inflamed mice. This is going back in actually in by IHC. We've actually been able to show this in human patient samples now as well. That was uh, in, in the studies of a colitis. Now, so you'd say, well, then rapamycin, which is an inhibitor against uh, mTOR, uh, that would be predicted to be anti-inflammatory. Uh, and so now you add uh, the, you add the uh, rapamycin, you measure the signals, and they predict again that you're going to shift yourself to the lower inflammatory states. All these are predicted shifts. Make the measurements, and that's indeed what happens. The addition of the mTOR takes the highly inflamed, naive T-cell adoptive uh, mice and shifts them at least back halfway. So mTOR is in the whole story. 
Now we go back and say, what else is involved? What other pathways might we need to co-drug or cytokines and chemokines to bring it back down the whole way? But, uh, but uh, again, the predictions, uh, predictions hold. So let me end here. We're doing similar things, actually, with Alzheimer's disease, which is an inflammatory disease, um, both from human cadaver tissues and from mouse models. A very interesting result that I might tell some of you offline uh, in review right now. And in fact, uh, with human patients with endometriosis, which is a woman's reprodu reproductive disease, inflammation in the peritoneal cavity, really devastating, uh, debilitating, and a uh, paper from a postdoc, Michael Besti, was out in Science Translational Medicine a couple months ago that took this same kind of analysis actually into the clinic and uh, identified, in fact, a uh, potential clinical target for a kinase pathway inhibitor. So let me end again. Uh, with appreciation to Kevin, Ken, Sarah, and Jesse, you can look up a lot of the work, everything except the adoptive T-cell transfer work and uh, funding sources. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, so we're doing well in terms of our schedule. We have a coffee break scheduled in a few minutes, but what we can do is open it up for questions now, then you'll be able to continue some discussions over coffee break, and then we'll be back in here at 10.30 for the next presentation. So, Hi, my name is Ronan. Uh, wonderful talk, a lot of good fun. And I was wondering, your key take home message that once you knock down or inhibit one pathway, that impacts and spreads to other pathways. So have you seen this impact in a single endpoint? Let's say hydrogen gamma or any other protein expressed. At the beginning you inhibit, so you get a depression of that expression, and then you get some sort of population of this? Yeah, the best example of that is when we went in with the uh, antibody against MCP1 or CCL2. Okay? And I kind of did it in passing. But I said, oh, then we generated new data and found other than points on the principal components uh, models and things like that. That's exactly right. So just by depleting that antibody, you change everything. I mean, depleting that, that chemokine, you change everything. You change the other chemokines and cytokines present, you change the intracellular kinase pathways, you change the mix of cell types present. It's, you know, that's, it's biology, it's physiology. And, and uh, you know, that's what's behind you know, the unfortunate problem with uh, lack of drug success, because it's all predicated on we've identified some molecule, we're going to inhibit that molecule, whether it's intracellular or extracellular, and because that molecule on the whole had this pro this or anti that effect, right, and we're now going to change that, and if everything else stays constant, we'll now shift ourselves to where we want to be. That's just it. Everything else doesn't stay constant, and it's just as simple and more complex as that. Um, yeah, so, so I think your models were mainly data driven. You they took all these measurements and, and basically didn't base this on any canonical pathways. Did you go back and see any difference now that you have these rules from the actual data? Did you go back and see differences in the canonical pathways of like kinase? And yeah, there's, um, we don't have enough measurement granularity. You know, because so one thing when you're trying to make the, the, the measurements, I'm going to go back to one thing here just for if I can. Uh, yeah, let me sit on that for a second. So, so the compromise we make, we're trying to what I'll call horizontally sample over multiple pathways. Now the problem with that is pound for pound, if you only have so much reagents and time and money and so forth, what you don't then get is vertical sampling down through a pathway. So we can see some known change. And what we don't know is too much granularity about what else happened upstream of it and downstream of it. Okay. So that's what the, uh, the fuzzy logic model is supposed to try to get at, is to say, all right, if we've measured mainly some things, AKT, MEC, or Okay, yet we know there's these intermediate nodes that we didn't measure. Okay, what's happening to the logic of the flow between the things that we did measure that go through things that we didn't measure that are required to account for those shifts? Okay, so now your question would be, all right, this model now says we've thickened some lines, uh, 
You go one way if you have KRAS mutation, you go another way if you have NNRAS mutation and so forth. One thing we're trying to do now is go back and look at these nodes that weren't measured in our high throughput Luminex way and with much more laborious biochemistry assays, go back into them and say, okay, were they shifted into the way that this logic model tells us? So I think that's what we would need to do to get at what you said. So that's the next step on this. Additional questions? Can you tell me a little bit more about your fuzzy logic model? Uh, what kind of software? Is, is there a software for it? Or? Yeah, so I want to give credit uh, largely to former postdoc Julio Saez Rodriguez, who worked with myself and Peter Soger. He's now got his own lab at the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute. If you go to his lab, that's where all the software resides. So he developed just a regular Boolean logic uh, for signaling. A lot of people have done that. Uh, and then in concert with us, so this is just what the constrained fuzzy logic looks like, is that instead of Boolean being on and off, it allows you to be graded in between. It adds an extra parameter to each logic gate, because now you've essentially got a slope. Okay. Along with just a location of where you shift from low to high, right? Now you've got a slope. Okay. And so you've constrained, what we've constrained fuzzy logic to is things of this shape where now the parameter becomes the slope. So it's not a finite state model then? No, no, that's right. Okay. That's right, that's right. It's, it's not. And, and it's trying to reflect the real biochemistry. And uh, that's one reason we like it. Um, it also does reveal logic that you don't see you know, if you just stick yourself with the, uh, with the finite state. But anyway, back to what you said. So right now, the model largely lives in, it's in MATLAB, but Julio's lab's converting it to R. Oh, okay. So if you go to Julio's uh, uh, lab website, you might now be able to find this in R. That's, that's the goal. So what happens when the logic is represented by the pattern of activation of the node? For example, you know, interleukin-6 is pro-inflammatory interleukin-10 is anti-inflammatory. They both activate STAT3, but one does it transiently, the other does it in prolonged fashion. They end up having almost opposite effects. Yeah, and that's, um, that's a detail that's under here, okay? And in these things, uh, these actually do have some time dynamic to them, okay? So that this weighting coefficient might be more on the half hour or the one hour or the four hour, okay? So right now we haven't uh, seen the differences, uh, but you can break out each one of these by time point or another thing Kevin James did, uh, he hasn't published yet actually, is to actually take the time dynamic curve, okay, and instead of just being measurement points here at different times, it's actually the curve that matters which actually does then have the early, late, and so forth. So, so that'll work in the PLS, but yeah. when you go to the transfer functions, can you do, does that get carried through? Ah, yeah, so with the transfer functions, uh, what you have to do is now you turn this into uh, time segments. So this might be what it looks like for early times, then a model next door is for the next step in time. So, so now another thing Julia's worked on, and a lot of other people, Stefan Klamp uh, in Germany, for instance, is now taking this and turning it into ODEs. Okay, right now all we've done is say, okay, let's get the model for the one hour time points. Okay, now what does the model look like for one hour to four hour? Okay, you just do it in early, late segments. But you can see uh, uh, literature where you actually turn these into differential equations then, and then all these things, these, these slopes then are actually changing with time. So they become the parameter that changes with time instead of concentrations. So, I assume the, the data you measure is not on a single shell level, so that's why you have the whole process and the liberation at the same time. Do you think that also might be happening because some cells is going on process, some cells are going to liberation? And do you think the single cell assay will help refine your model? Uh, that's really interesting. Um, I think you're right. For the most part, you know, different things are happening in different regions of the, of, of the tissue. What's happening in ileum is different from what's happening in duodenum, and, and we haven't talked about that much, but we have another model for the ileum and proliferation there. Um, but yeah, it is true that in any given segment of the tissue, some cells might be proliferating, some might be apoptosing, it's not going to be 100 uh, or one or the other. 
Yeah, so if you went to single cells, that'd be lovely. Um, I think we'd actually have to have single cell signaling measurements then too. Right. And so I think it's a technology that'll come. Right? You'd be able to look at individual cells, uh, both their phenotype and their signaling. Uh, we don't, I don't see that available yet, but uh, I think that's something that's coming down the road. And that'd be great. Well, let's take our break now, our coffee break. Uh, I'll be, of course, rounding you up to get back in here by 10.30. But before we break, uh, join me in thanking uh, Doug for a very interesting presentation.